We are recording. Hannah Shergold, absolute pleasure to have you in the HR studio. Very happy, one, because we connected, two, because you positively replied to my invitation for the podcast, and three, we managed to get it in relatively soon after our online introduction. Yeah, thank Welcome. you for having me. Welcome. Also, very happy to discover that on the, on the icebreaker, your interest in psychology yes. and certain areas. Yep. Psychopathy. What the heck does psychopathy mean? You use that word yep. on the icebreaker. I don't yep. know what it means. Go on. It's psychopaths, basically. It's you know this the it's not the study of, but it's the um, the the pathology of it, the the illness of it, the the deficiency. How psychopaths come to be psychopaths? Yeah, it's sort of it's. Um, so if I said it slightly different and I said psychopathy, it's, it would make more sense. But um, was I pronouncing it wrong? No, it's psychopathy. That's psychopathy. that's how some yeah. people would say it. But but yeah, I find it all fascinating and and you know in very and it's all been quite a sort of recent experience of um, reading about it and uh, just discovering it, it just makes so much sense of so many people that if where you've been trying to sort of puzzle out why they make certain decisions, why they behave in such ways. And and then uh, because there, there seems to be quite a lot of patterned behaviour with certain types of people with this sort of general lack of empathy, um, I'm always looking for patterns and, and why people do things and, what, you know, what will make people do things. And, and that just suddenly it was like this light bulb moment. I was just like, oh, this person that I... I could never figure out. I could never. We didn't get on. We. Just, I just couldn't figure out why they would make such decisions. Now, in hindsight, it makes perfect sense. Um, you know, whether it's old bosses or, um, or or colleagues or 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 even soldiers that were. You know, I just. I just couldn't figure. I couldn't work it out why they would make such decisions. But now some of it makes sense. Well, the why is fascinating, right? I agree. Yeah. So, it's, so the psych, so psychology is a recent, I was going to say infatuation then. It's not absolutely not an infatuation, but a recent area of a, a area that I really want to understand better. Mm. One, I think we were talking earlier, one, because if I understand psychology a bit better, I understand myself a bit better. Absolutely. But also, yeah. equally as important, if I understand psychology a bit better, I understand other people a bit better. To yeah. your point, yeah. it's it's less about the, what they did, it's why they did it. Yeah. Why they why they make a decision or do a thing. Um, <clears throat> what's fascinating about that to me is, it's like, you can it can be, someone's action can be down to one very specific experience they had at any point in their mm. life, child or adult, mm. one very specific that has, a, has had, for some reason, mm. a profound impact on them. Or it can be a, a whole, uh, like a whole era of experience that's yep. just impacted them and, yep. and, 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 and no two people are the same. The why fascinates me 100%. Yeah, and it's, um, it, it, I think for me, it's actually having the confidence in myself that, you know, that these you know, certain behaviours or, or traits of, of other people. <coughs> I was almost taking it personally that, but by understanding them more, understanding myself more, and, you know, I have, everybody has narcissistic traits. They're not necessarily narcissists, but we've, it's, it's, a, it's a spectrum. Um, and, and a lot of it can be learned <coughs> or, um, and in fact, some people argue that, you need a level of of narcissism to not a level of narcissism but you need a level of sort of let's use another word selfishness um as self-care and so what i found though is understanding more about that has made me much more confident in my own person and my own sort of my own likes and dislikes, my own preferences, my own way of being, you know, for example, I'm very introverted and I, but I like, I sort of come out of my cave every now and again and, you know, I enjoy spending time with other people, but I get relaxation from being by myself and, you know, pottering away in my studio and, and, and I love that. Um, but I, 
I spent a lot of time thinking there was something wrong with me for that. And yeah, I knew I was introverted, but it was, I've kept trying to be what other people felt was socially acceptable. You know, I don't drink. I, it, and it's only this year that I finally sort of said, you know, said to, to other people, no, I, I, I don't drink. I don't like it. I don't like how it makes me feel. And, um, and I stopped apologising for it. And so this whole understanding of trying to understand other people has, you know, as a sort of what's come out of that is I'm much more confident in myself to just be accepting of it. And then those people that aren't as much aligned, we can still be friends, but they're not, they don't have to be in my tribe. And that's no, that's no bad reflection of them it's no bad reflection of me we're just different and that's okay and i it's it's like this totally refreshing way of being that i'm not trying to align myself with all this different spectrum of people that are not the same as me it's not a bad thing it's just uh, we're just different yeah, I was thinking about this. I've been thinking about something along these lines recently, and it's prob- maybe for the same reasons. Just when you go into that, and reading anything about psychology, and like you just start evaluating yourself and why you are doing things, mm. the way you would, or the way you are behaving, or why are you are choosing to uh, associate or not associate with people, mm. a person or a group. Mm. <clears throat> and one of the one of the uh, one of those realizations or it's more like a way i want to do things or behave is is on that inclusion of people it, it's no so it's, it's evaluating who is valuable to me yes. i'm understanding okay why is why is that val- person yeah. valuable to me because right now they're not valuable and, yeah. as it, and and that that in itself seems really selfish right you say, when you think value it's when you explain it like that it makes it sound like i want i only want people in my life i can get something from it, it's not I no. s- so the value I, yep. the value I have is it's trust. Yeah. And that is it. Trust uh, trust in that when I'm engaged with that person mm. I can I can believe that what they're saying they they are saying it honestly and truly. Mm. They, there's no ulterior motive. I can believe what they're saying that, that is their opinion mm. that they're expressing and there's nothing else outside of that. And that's mm. fine. And that opinion may not align with what I think. And that is quite often the case, but it doesn't matter. I, I listened to this person, you know. wonderful little um, reel the other day, and you know whether you like the language in it or not is is sort of irrelevant. But it was basically saying that you know to not give your whole self to other people is not selfish; it's self full. And she basically said you know my she started this this sort of analogy of you know my cup runneth over whatever is i have to look after what is in the cup and once whatever overflows out of the cup you can have but what is in the cup is mine and i have to make sure that that i spend or we have to make sure that we spend enough time just making sure that we're okay first in order that we can give to other people and I found that it's been a little bit of a mindset shift for me to kind of not feel like that is a selfish thing to do you know I've I've I felt very selfish if I don't if I say no to things if I you know if I say you know I just don't feel like doing that at the moment. And yeah, there are some things where you do have to, you know, sacrifice, put yourself out when it's not convenient and it's um, and it's the last thing that you want to do. But you you tend to know what those things are. You know, you, you put yourself out when other people are really in need. Um, but But until that point, they can't have everything of you. And that's not selfish. It's just, you know, it's it's a level of self care which I'm just I'm not used to at the moment. I'm kind of learning that. Um, but it must be hard in your position, right? Because you because you know that um, you know that if you put time and effort towards something mm. that towards something, 
you, you've got a lot of opportunity, for, not opportunity, you've got a lot of uh, potential at your fingertips to, for example, generate money for A, N, A, A B or C fundraiser, right? Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that because of the person you are and what you do mm. and the money you have raised, shit loads of money, yeah. have raised for different causes, merely Tusk, right? That you have people knocking on your door regularly for um, favours or effort towards other philanthropic, charitable mm. things, right? Interestingly, I get that less now that oh, the really? profile has built up. Before, when I, when I was less well known as an artist I mean, i'm not i'm not i wouldn't say i was sort of famous now as an artist but my work is recognized in certain circles um but <laughs> it's a modest way of putting it. yeah well um <laughs> but when i was it's almost like before when the work was less valuable people charities almost felt like <clears throat> they were doing me a favor by allowing me to be a part of their um organization and um I didn't really have any problem saying no at that point because I was I was very clear what was required in order to grow the business and it and it I was very happy to support um um one charity at a time but I was very clear that if I spread myself too thin it was going to be detrimental to me to the work to the you know the philanthropic effort of it and um so I found it I didn't find it too difficult to explain to people I I can't I can't do everything. Um where I almost came a cropper this year was that I committed early in the year to raising 100,000 pounds for Tusk and I did what I always do I announce it I go public with it and I book a massive show which you know my shows now cost this year cost you know before the sponsorship started to come in I've got to kind of commit to about fifty five sixty thousand pounds just to run it um with no sales and and I commit to all that before I've <coughs> painted a single painting and I'm used to that I've done that f four five times now with a sort of um the the big announcement and then think, oh God, like now I've got to actually do it but just after I had done that um in my person, my personal life just completely fell apart, and um, I, you know, I I was in a relationship with a narcissist, and uh, he was sort of trying to take away my home and my studio at the same time, and and I realised that I needed to buy him out, but the only way I could do that was to have a bumper year with the business in order to be able to prove the mortgage. Um, and I, I spoke to Tusk and said, look, this is happening. It, it had sort of, it meant that I asked of them, I, I said, well, what I need you to do is, um, you know, just make sure that it's the show is broadcast, etc." But I didn't back down on the, they, even though they were saying, don't worry about the, the 100,000, we totally understand. I personally was like, no, I'm going to do it even to the point where it could have meant that I couldn't afford to keep my house. Now, in my head, that was the right way around to do it. Um, I, I ended up being able to do both, um, but it wasn't through, you know, I, I literally worked myself into the ground to be able to do that. Why was it the right way around in your head to do it? That's a very, very good question, because in the back of my mind, it would have been selfish i think deep down in my mind it would have been selfish to not give that money to charity in favor of keeping my house how backwards is that it isn't it isn't right because it i know what you mean but you've also is it also that you've promised to do something you've well, committed yes. to doing something yeah you've got an expectation you've got a mission to achieve and you can't yeah. not achieve that mission Yes, and I'm very much kind of I will do whatever it takes to do it, and that um, can defy logical like decision making. Definitely. Yes, it can, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and sometimes I look at my own decisions. I'm like, you idiot! Like you have really you've come a cropper this time, um, but 
I suppose one of the things that makes you vulnerable to these kind of sort of narcissistic relationships is that you are too conscientious and you t you are you will do anything to make it work you will you will fix it even if that means driving yourself into the ground and the further away the target gets you know because in that kind of relationship no matter what you do you it's always going to be wrong and it's 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 always going to fail but I didn't realize that at the time so I you know I just kept working and working and working to try and fix it and um but this conscientious trait I've always had I've you know ever since I was you know ever since I can remember my homework was always perfect it was as good as I could get it even if it was late it was I would rather hand it in slightly late but it'd be perfect um and so yeah I think that's what I've done this year I, I'll just keep going I'll just um if that means I'm working flat out for for six months um you know 16 hours a day plus in order to a turn out a collection but also then um bring a show together um and it was not a small show it was a it was a um it was on the mal at mal galleries i took over the whole the whole gallery and um <coughs> the week after the jubilee 250 <laughs> guest preview um and I self-represent, so I don't have a gallery, you know, I don't have gallery representation or staff to kind of organise all that bit. I just, I do that all myself. And, um, but it was just kind of right, that's just, and the whiteboard came out and, uh, you know, I came up with a plan because I had to. And, yeah, that's that's just how I roll. And then I had three months off to recover because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I needed to to sleep for one, but also just to like piece together what happened and and um, just I, I didn't ever want to be in that situation again. So um, yeah, it was it was uh, I'd say back in March I'd committed to the show in June, but back in March I think that was the lowest I have ever been. That was you know borderline breakdown and the only thing that kept me going was just this was actually sort of well I, I I have to I've got a show to run so even if I am you know crying about what's happened or or you know deeply stressed I've got to be crying and deeply stressed with a palette knife in my hand and producing something at the same time I haven't got time to to waste on you know, grief or, um, you know, m mindfulness or I, I just don't have time to do it. I will do that all once this show is done. That was my only way out of it. Did you do that? Do what? Did you deal with all the emotional side once the show was done? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Well, I'm still, de I'm still dealing with it, you know, still kind of, but that's, I find, but in a sort of healthy, quite satisfying way, actually. Um, you know, really delving into why we make decisions, why, you know, how, like I said before, how people are different and how that can be, you know, celebrated. But equally, you don't have to, you don't have to align with everybody on the planet. You you don't, that's, it's not how it's meant to be. Um, but, yeah, just taking, just taking a little bit of time to, you know, do some reading and, uh, therapy is for winners <laughs> but, and I, I, I strongly believe that I think having somebody else who knows what they're doing to help you puzzle through some of this stuff is incredibly valuable and I I would not have said that this time last year I was very kind of no I'm, I'm fine I don't need that I, mm. um, but it's been incredibly helpful there's an element of frustration there sometimes isn't there where, uh, where you, where you realise that they could have in a different world. You could have you could have not ended up in that situation. 
but it only could have happened if, with if you have the knowledge that you have now that you learned because of the situation oh, and brought it back. Completely, and I'm a, I'm a massive, massive believer in things happening for a reason. I don't. I'm not. Um, I'm not religious, but I am very superstitious, and I do believe in fate. And you are superstitious. I am superstitious, and you believe in fate. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, even when even at that real proper low point in March, um, I was I still remember thinking something amazing is going to come of this. I don't know what it is yet, but something amazing is is going to come out of feeling so utterly rubbish. And one day I'm going to be really grateful that I felt this rubbish. And I and I really did. Um, you know, I had a I had a lot of um, sort of complex PTSD um, manifestations of, of what had gone on and, you know, physical signs of stress and, you know, the shaking, my my hair was falling out. I mean it was it was really it was really quite bad. Um, I didn't necessarily realise all of that was connected at the time, but but hindsight's a wonderful thing. But 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 like I say, even then, it was like no, it's going to be fine. I, ju- I this is just this is going to be another chapter that is going to contribute to something amazing later on, and I'll look back on it and and think I'm actually really glad I had to do that bit because it led to this. And and what's come out of it so far? I mean, there will be other things, I'm sure, but what's come out of it so far is is this reading about psychology I found it absolutely fascinating I'm really glad that I've had to do it um painful as it has been I'm really glad that it's made me I feel like I've got this totally new understanding of people and myself and and you know I think unless you've been through it you it all sounds it can all sound a little bit wishy-washy and self-indulgent but um but I, I don't care. <laughs> like I've, um, yeah, I. It's, where did you it's start? Great. Where did you start with your your learning journey for psychology? Who or where did you start with? Well, I found a therapist who specialises in narcissism, and um, I. I had my first assessment with her, and um, she gave me two books. Um, the first of which. The second of which I won't share because it, it um, <laughs> because it leads to a conversation which is not shareable. Okay. Okay. Um, but the 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 first one was called "Women Who Love Psychopaths," and <clears throat> and I thought, yep, she's onto something here. And but she said I'd already, you know, I'd already listened to every podcast, every um, audio book that I could find about what I thought had happened, and. Um, so the first half of this book she was like you've done that bit to death that's all about him what he is you know etc um, but the second bit is about you and your traits and 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 I found that really fascinating because three traits too empathetic too conscientious too agreeable and so the agreeable bit is you just give people the benefit of the doubt for everything. You know, you it's, oh maybe they did that because of this. Maybe he said that because of such and such. Maybe she did this because she was having a bad day or whatever. There's always a reason rather than just, no, they're being a dick and there's no excuse for that. Um, so then that led on to a lot of, you know, where does this come from? You know, why... why do I behave like that? Um, you've got this constant back of the mind, um, am I a narcissist uh, question that is threaded all the way through. And, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the traits that you sort of learn um, throughout life, yeah, some of them can be narcissistic traits. And, and but I think... Some of, although some of this learning is painful about yourself and you know about it that enables you to change and fix it and correct things that you don't necessarily that, you, that you're doing that you're thinking like, actually I don't want to be like that I don't I don't want to think like that I don't want to 
judge like that, react like that. And so you can just slowly start to try and, with the knowledge, you can slowly start to try and unpick some of that. How would you, how would you apply that in your daily life and the way you're living without being too uh, analytical of yourself and and second guessing all of the things that you're doing or thinking or saying? Because there is risk there, right? Yeah, there is, and I'm still pretty. I'm still pretty early on this whole journey. Um, I think <clears throat> it, it takes a while to get past feeling that all this change that you're making in yourself is a selfish thing to do and um, particularly if that change is affecting other people and their perception of you and, and their, their norm of you and and that's difficult for them as well And but um, actually one of the one of the pieces of advice I got quite early on from my therapist she said do you ruminate I was like, oh, that's something that cows do um but she said you know do you turn things over in your mind all the time and I said yeah constantly I'm constantly having internal conversations with a person about what I would say to them if they challenged me in a certain way if they asked me a certain question if they you know if they um insulted me in a certain way I'm I'm constantly going through that and she said you've got to stop doing that um and I said why uh, because it you know it feels like I'm sort of quietly giving myself therapy and she said because you're, what you're actually doing is you're giving yourself an endorphin rush because you're sat you're, because you're solving the problem in your head you're getting this satisfaction <coughs> and endorphin rush from it and it becomes addictive and that made a lot of sense actually and so actually the change to um, almost stop yourself, like forcefully stop yourself from doing that, distract yourself, and move on with the day. Actually, that was a really good piece of advice. And I, because she explained it in a sort of, I'm, I have a sciencey background, so because she explained it in a sciencey way of what I was actually getting from it, it because it made sense, I could, I could sit with that and, and say actually yeah okay I'll I'll take that um yeah that was that was that was very useful it's a balance to strike isn't it because you need to be analytical of yourself in some in some way shape or form to some level but going down the rabbit yeah. hole every constantly every day is not the way to do it um and actually it's one of the it's it was one of the things which kind of gave me comfort that I wasn't a narcissist myself <laughs> you know when I'm trying to puzzle out all of this stuff is it's actually you know a narcissist isn't going to sit and do that they're not going to sit and self-analyze and work things out and work out where they went wrong and um they're just not going to do that so actually it was kind of comforting to me to know that I wasn't as horrid as this person from what you've been reading so far, is it more mm. is narcissism more commonly found in men than women? I don't know the answer to that question. What I will say is, um, it, it isn't gender specific. You can, you know, there are there are a lot of women as well who can can be horribly narcissistic, and and I think we have this confusion about narcissism in that it we we liken it with vanity the sort of instagram self love it isn't that it's it's it is a lack of a complete lack of empathy um in the same way as psychopaths have a lack of empathy um they they you know narcissists as we know it the sort of overt ones are the ones that we we see as the sort of loud and proud center of attention a bit annoying um can you give an example of a narcissist in the in the public eye right now donald trump I, okay really um, yeah classic yeah and again that kind of confusion of how could he possibly 
think that what he is doing is correct a lot of the time. And and actually, he d- he's not even malicious. He doesn't really even know that he's doing it. Um, so... Give me, can you give me examples of behaviour with him? Because um, I sometimes think that the public people... Are, well, how much of this am I seeing is true? What is it? Is so, it put so on public persona, very conscious? It's really hard to tell. I think it's just this total self-belief in himself. So self-belief in himself. This total self-belief that what he's doing is right is that there's there's no. Um, he wouldn't be able to hear someone else's opinion. Take it on board and perhaps change what he felt about something. The, but the difference between an overt narcissist like like he is and a covert narcissist, that was what really threw me because every time I read this word narcissism, I was like, well, if he's not like that. He's very modest, shy, um, this complete. You're not talking about Trump now, are you? No, no, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> no. This covert, this covert narcissism yeah, yeah. is is that's the dangerous one because they can they they have little or no empathy, but they can mimic it, and um, so they can mm. they if you point out to them how when, when it matters to them, if if you point out to them like how they're making you feel or or whatever they will change their behavior because they've been told you know where the, the sort of chink in the armor is and um there's three very basically there's three very distinct phases you go through this long sort of love bombing phase where you match my my values my likes and dislikes my um everything about me i i was like oh my god i found my soulmate this is amazing but then this long, slow devaluation period where didn't like my job, my um, what I did, how I interacted with my friends, like um, or my family, uh, didn't like how much I worked, didn't and but it's so slow that you don't even realise it's happening, and then and then eventually complete discard. Um, that, yeah, and that was so fast that it was I didn't I didn't know what hit me like complete um but that pattern is is quite consistent and so even if you're not in a in a um in a relationship that pattern of behaviors can you can also see it in in your colleagues or bosses or w- that have these same traits and so I you know I remember certain people that they they are your your best friend when you first start working with them or working for them. They you know they want to know everything about you. They want to, and they're learning you. They are learning um, how to manage you, how to uh, work you, and and then just this slowly picking away at you and and real deep seated stuff about you, values and and how you work. Not just certain little things that you've done, but you know things that make you kind of recoil and um and feel like shit uh but it's that that pattern is now that now that you sort of see it and especially with a little bit of hindsight applied to it it just makes so much more sense and it stops affecting you in the same way because it's not personal it's not you it's yeah, you you will have messed up sometimes, and um, you'll have done things which, in hindsight, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I would have done that differently. Of course, any normal person would do that, but um, but the way in which that is handled by by someone with these either narcissistic traits or who is flat out a narcissist, um, it, it, there's a real pattern to it, and that has been a real eye opener for me, and. But it's also it's like a weight lifted off my shoulders because, like I say, it's not it's not personal. It, I can just I can assign that lack of relationship to them rather than something that was wrong with me, and that w- that has been one of the biggest reliefs that I'm I'm not still looking back on things and saying, 
why did I get that wrong? Why, you know, I did exactly the same. I worked in exactly the same way with that person as I had done with my previous boss. And with, you know, it was, I'd always done well like that. And, um, it wasn't me. It wasn't personal. So what was the impact on you with the, with the dealing with the narcissist? Was this, was it, was it, self no self esteem low self confidence lack of belief um it oh, can I, in fact don't answer so that don't, it's, no, I, no, I, it's fine i i, I mean i don't want to go away i've blocked anyway, him from every know. form of social media so you <laughs> never hear it but um it was it's happened it happened so fast in the end that a lot of this puzzling out has been in hindsight when you say it what do you mean the the end of the of this relationship happened so fast i mean when i <laughs> at the time because of this long period of devaluation i didn't even realize how bizarre some of this behavior was towards the end devaluation as in devaluing you devaluing as a person. me as a person and making me just work harder and harder and harder to have a good relationship when, you know, it, it was never going to get there. But it, but real playing on this sort of my conscientious trait that I would just do whatever it took to fix it. And um, But just to give you an, an insight, it took two and a half weeks between when we decided to end our relationship to when he wanted to bring other women back into my home. And, and I was like, uh, well, there must be something wrong with me that I don't want him to do that. You know, that's how twisted it was. And, um, but yeah, so a, a lot of, a lot of what I've ha been having to like work out is, is, how much I was, I was kind of brainwashed at the time to to believe that it was all me um and but no I'm glad that I'm glad I'm really glad I've been through it it was it was a horrible experience but um uh and you know with sort of threats of physical violence and and uh things that I never ever thought I would be in that situation but I'm really glad it's happened that I am totally glass half full when it comes to that. I, I am kind of a pathological optimist. And I, I like that about myself. Um, it has got me through some, not just recent tough times, but, you know, <coughs> when things are, when things are tough or, or bad, I, you know, right down to sitting in a muddy puddle in sand, on a sand test exercise, it was about as miserable as I've been. But even at the time, I can kind of think, you know, one day I'm going to find it really funny how miserable I am at this particular moment. And I always do. I have this great set of rose-tinted specs that you sort of look back and, you know, everything was... Even the rubbish times are really funny. Um, but, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful that I've sort of had the opportunity to... to go through that I, I'm not saying I want it to happen again but yeah well I'm of the firm belief <clears throat> rightly or wrongly sorry people have had an easy life I'm, I am of the firm belief that people who have had very 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 difficult experiences and I, I define that by emotional experiences they yep. struggle and that could be whatever whatever it was doesn't have to be some life net anything doesn't have to, it could be you know something is like i <clears throat> i get people who you get people who have life changing experiences through nearly getting hit by a car yep. not getting hit by the car yep. not seeing someone else get hit by the car but nearly getting hit by a car yep. and it changes them completely yep. and i'm the true belief that people who have those experiences and have and have changed from it maybe for the better or for the or, or for the worse they are essential Yep. in society they are absolutely essential mm. because most people won't have an experience like that most won't and you need people who do have the shite experiences and get through it to be able to communicate those alternative sort of viewpoints perceptions on life or whatever you want it to be or simply be someone who is around when someone else is experiencing a similar thing they've not yep. been through you have been through it yep. that person hasn't 
and you've got you know exactly what they're about to go through and you can offer support in whatever way shape. when we were talking about this briefly before the podcast when we well, like it's vital in the same way as i hope i will never have the experience of real depression um and i and so therefore i can't i can try <coughs> and empathize with people but i'll never really know how it feels to be in that situation equally i know that unless people have been through what i've been through they will when i try and describe it to people like the real sort of nitty-gritty of day-to-day life in the situation it sounds so unbelievably petty but but it was i know that i don't actually have to explain it to them i don't need to explain it to them I know what it felt like. I know it was wrong, and um, uh, what I, uh, where I am able to offer support is that, you know, as I've sort of, you know, gradually sort of by osmosis fed out a, a, some information <coughs> to various networks that I'm in. Um, y- you can tell that those people that are either have been through it or are going through it at the moment, um, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And they make a beeline for me to say, like, I, I help, like, I need help. What can you offer? And I can give them, you know, books, um, you know, advice via, you know, advice direct from me. I can give them, you know, the contact details of my counsellor, my solicitor, my, you know, because getting rid of somebody like that is you need people that understand it. And that even my solicitor is trained in this kind of behaviour because it affects how they handle it. It's not normal. And if you ha- if you try and handle it in a normal way, um, as a normal solicitor would do in any kind of divorce, you'll come a cropper. And um, so I I so being for me being able to offer that kind of specialist, I, I, I say specialist. That's a bit much. Um, but that understanding of what they're going through and because it's a pattern of behavior it's it's so easy to see the people that are going through that kind of thing they only have to describe a few small things which to them they'll probably be sounding petty as well but it's like i know i know exactly where you're coming from um but it's it's an interesting one because we're not going to get rid of this issue in fact, if anything, it's getting worse. Why would you say that? Because of... Oh, the issue, the, the issue, issue being the existence of SARS. Narcissism. Of, of narcissism, yep, yeah. Yep. We're not going to get rid of it because our culture and the way in which we're going in terms of social media and everything actually lends itself to this lack of emotional feedback um, and... You know, it, it's proven. We, you know, we are seeing a lot more of this behaviour. Um, th- you know, you see uh, even people like um, relationship counsellors are seeing so much more of it. Um, anyone in that kind of field will tell you that this, the the prevalence of this kind of trait is getting a lot worse. And so the question is, okay, well, what do we do about it? Um, you know, the army is is a kind of environment that actually lends itself to traits like that. It attracts people like that. It's a status job. It's it, well, certainly certain trades. Um, you know, pilots, surgeons, um, traders, people that earn a lot of money. These are real prime trades for um, for narcissism. And so if we are attracting that kind of person and rewarding, actually, their ability to um, succeed in that environment, we're rewarding their ability to work out other people and work out who they need to tread on in order to get where they need to be, to get the right report, to promote, to... We are rewarding that. And, you know, some of the, um, some of the conversations and, and work that I've been sort of on the side involved in is um, 
how do we fix that? How do we stop rewarding it? How do we change the how do we change the reward system that we are not basically benefiting this kind of person escalating through because ultimately they are not good for the system they're not we're not going to we're not going to end up with the best force possible if we have somebody that is really only interested in themselves and their own self promotion and their own career progression and not give a shit about anyone underneath them so we start so it's a really difficult one to fix because the whole system is based on you know reports every 2 years and speaking to the right people and making sure that you know you're you're liked by the right people i'm not saying that's the only way to get ahead but it's a very it's a kind of if you can work that system you can get ahead very quickly and um how do we interrupt that and i think that the idea so far is that you, you change you change the goals you change the goals to be not about your personal progression you change the goals to be about how you have enabled other people to progress and i still don't have that's a theory but that's i still don't have and even the people working on it don't necessarily have the the answers to that question about how do you change that um i agree it's a good point i just that's a very good point i know i know you're using the military as an example that's a very good point when i think about you know where i work just in general uh oh no not just where i work right anywhere any any place of work you promote when you promoted on on in a place where you promoted on, on merit, merit let's say let's ignore the mates rate side and who you know and who yeah. you speak to outside of work hours or whatever but when you promote it on merit that merit is that merit is based on what you produced in the short term for the benefit of the business yeah as and it ignores and in front of the right people in front of the right people and it ignores to which i think the point you were making is it ignores the long-term benefit you brought to the business or even the industry in that one example development of the people below you yeah or alongside you yeah uh or the business as a whole yeah interesting um, yeah but i wonder i mean that i mean i was going to say is that not just simply a case of changing what you're measuring well it's not y- yes and, and it may it may well be that that's a part of it um i i still don't see how that would work in its entirety because it's so subjective how it's very very difficult to measure and and you could quite you could just as easily say well that person didn't progress because of them not because i didn't enable it and so it would be just it would be too easy to pass blame um so i'm not saying i have the answers but i think it's it's a question that needs you know needs asking and it's interesting that in my last couple of years in the army before I had any kind of knowledge of this aspect of psychology a lot of what a, a, a big piece of work I was trying to do was about um uh sexual harassment in the army and that was back in 2016-17 it was only last week that a piece of um one of the um compulsory bits of training that came out it's, i'm still a reservist so i i have to do these various mats and and things as as everyone else does um but it was only last week that one came out about unacceptable sexual behavior and just guiding people through what is criminal what is not criminal oh, but, un- but unacceptable and and i was like we're in 2022 how on earth has it taken this long to publish something like that? That is ridiculous. If that's the one you're thinking of, I think I had a slight problem with it. Well, I'm I'm I'm, a, I'm massively open to discussion because uh, I let me have a look here. One second. My problem was not with having the policy. Yeah. Absolutely not. Uh, where is it? 
Where is it? Sorry, sorry. I'm scrolling through a Discord chat. Two Navy friends. Uh, where the hell is it? So the problem we had with it was... Um, sorry, people listening or watching on my phone. Sorry, Hannah. You can't get the staff these days, can you? <laughs> uh, One job. Oh, did I download it? Uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, I think the, ooh, the problem I had with it was... Okay, it what it tried what it did, if this is the same thing we're talking yeah. about, what it did was it listed all of the things that could be considered as uh, sexual harassment in certain circumstances, if the circumstances were right. Right. And you know, you would look at them and think some some things that's just normal in certain in normal circumstances. In other circumstances, it may not be, but by listing them all. Mm. The people who are in leadership or management positions within the military who are not great in those positions, I can just imagine that there are a shitload of sexual harassment cases gearing up right now, yep. which are completely unfounded. But yep. based on the fact that there is a bullet point in that list that says, I don't know, for example, uh, I don't. Oh, oh, one of them was um, uh, unwelcome physical contact or something like that. One of them was, right? Well. Um, you know, I suppose I come at it. I come at it from a slightly different angle, in that I, for the for the most part of my training, I was the only girl, and um, where we sort of we ended up coming a cropper was that so much behaviour was normalised, and you can't you can't as the only girl in the situation you are fighting to stay on that course and to fit in you want to fit in with your um with your male counterparts and you know they're all friends and um but this kind of normalization of deviance where certain behaviours are accepted one day and then the following day something a little bit worse happens but it's only a little bit worse than what was accepted yesterday so we then accept that as well we end up with something that is downright criminal and but it is accepted because it's just got gradually worse and worse and worse and um, I suppose my problem with it is that there's no easy method for people in and I say people it's not necessarily women it's also you know people of color um uh people of different sexual orientations Th- my point is that if they're the only one they cannot stick their hand up and say I feel uncomfortable because they because they are so desperate to fit in that's the situation I was in and so my um, my point has always been about education and you will always have in a unit, you will always have, frankly, the assholes who you will, no matter how much E&D training you give them or D&I, whatever we're calling it this month, um, they will always be assholes. You will not swing them. Equally, you will always have the people that are, no matter what, they will do the right thing, even if it's at their own detriment. But it's the swing voters in the middle and if you don't tell them what is what the consequences can be of them doing nothing, how will they ever know? And what I found was that when I went back to them after uh, several years after some pretty serious um, issues had arisen, and I said to them, look, because you didn't do anything at that time, this happened and then this happened and then this happened, they were mortified. They were horrified that they, that their lack of action had had such dire consequences for me. And they felt that if they had only known, if they could go back, they would have done things differently. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's educating those people that it is so important for them to stick their hand up and say, mate, that was totally out of order, go and apologise. You know, and do it on the on behalf of the person that is... But you know, being subjected to this kind of moral whether courage, it's, it's moral e- courage, exactly. But we 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 preach moral courage and values and standards. But 
I don't think we actually, I don't think we always know what it means. And you do get the laugher along us. And they will, it's just easier. And it's, it's human nature. You know, people take the path of, path of least resistance. But it's having that courage to recognise it first, which isn't always easy. Um, particularly if the, the, the person in that situation is, um, because they're trying to fit in, they will end up laughing along. They'll end up being part of the joke and contributing to the joke because they want to fit in. And, But that doesn't mean that they're in that situation willingly they're just doing they're just surviving they're just getting by in whatever no in whatever way they can and and they may not even realize that that is a coping mechanism until it comes back to bite them m- mm. many e- months years down the line and so i th- i'm i'm always if you educate people it's only the same as going through sound test if you or, or, or any kind of basic training. If you don't teach people, you can't pick them up for it. So you're taught the very basic <coughs> basics of what I expect in how to iron a shirt. If you then get it wrong, then I can pick you up on it. But I haven't, if I haven't taught you that, then I, how will I expect you to know? And I, I think that this training about what is classified as inappropriate, you know, um, touching, you know, I used to walk into the office and somebody used to slap my ass. You know, did I like it? Absolutely not. It, sometimes it bloody hurt. Um, it was totally, it, it's actually assault, legally. It is assault. Um, what, did year, I, what year was this? Oh, 2012, <laughs> 2013. You know. I'm not, I'm just asking because I knew it would be recent. That's what yeah, yeah, exactly. And, or... I, I've got nothing against the policy. Like, yeah. I've got a, a point, I think, to explain what I meant. So I found it there. I found it there, but... Um, my, what I, what I, when I read it, what I was worried about was it wasn't worded in the best way. No. It wasn't worded in the best way. Yeah. You just know. Not everyone's as capable in... in, in you know, it's, it's, when I read them, we're just interpreting things. But to, your, but to your point, it's much more important to have it out than it is not and risk some people getting... Uh, some people getting um, unnecessary accusations against them than having one person uh, dis- uh, like decide not to be you anymore because the torment they're going through is so horrendous. I mean... Uh, I think I find this really interesting, though, is that because we come at it from totally different angles your take on the consequences of outlining that are that people will make false accusations and use and use the policy to um be able to pick people up in a in a way that is unfounded or uh, and i'm not saying that's wrong i just find it very interesting the 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 fact that that's the angle that you come from. I must explain it then. Okay. My concern is you'll get someone read a list and say, oh, it, it uh, says here that uh, uh, unwelcome physical contact uh, is uh, uh, could be uh, seen as sexual harassment. Well, uh, I would say walking in and getting your ass slapped oh, in the I'm, office. Oh, is, I 100% agree. It, but, the, but that's how would you, how, unless you go down to, you know, unwanted ass slapping, you know, you get, how I, do you I, define it? Do you see what I mean? I, like, agree, with, I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, it's misinterpretation of it. Yes, morons. I'm saying most people be fine with it. I yeah. wanna, can I go back and edit out what I said? No, 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 no. <laughs> but no, but but this is the whole. This is the whole thing, isn't it? Is that how do we? It the army is such a, an interesting culture. Um, we've got a lot of traditions in there. We've you know your obviously power background and you know which is you know that has brought up some real controversies over the last few months about um, uh, collective punishment and, you know, culture. And last few months, last so few years. They've had a right ride of it the last few years. Yeah, so. absolutely. And, and um, you know, and, and I've experienced that, which I think is... I'm, I'm not for para bashing just because they're paras. I, I'm... I don't care what cat badge you are. If you be- if your behaviour is inappropriate and it's detrimental to us as a fighting force, 
I couldn't give a shit whether you were a red berry or a, or a hat as everyone else has known. I don't care. It is you are breaking values and standards and you are not as good a soldier as you could be. Um, the best soldiers, the best fighting soldiers should also have the ability to have empathy. Bottom line. Which, which are you referring to a specific incident here? No. Okay. I could if you wanted to. Well, the empathy bit. Where were we? No, not at okay. all. I think, bottom line, a good soldier should ha be able to have empathy. Mm -hmm. This goes back to three block war stuff. You know, how can you... How can you also go into, into the battlefield and really recognise people's needs, humanitarian needs, if you don't have empathy? And I think the danger is that we train that out. Really? The danger is. I'm not saying we do. I think the danger is we select for lack of empathy. Oh, I don't know about that. Go on, why do you think that? No, I'm, saying, I'm not saying that we do. I'm yeah. saying the danger is we get to a point where we reward lack of empathy. If in the conversation we were previously talking about, in terms mm -hmm. of those people that are willing to tread ah. on others and get ahead. Um, if we if we are rewarding that, we are selecting for lack of empathy. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, when I you mean, were talking... I'm curious to know if you agree. No, when you were I talking mean, about empathy, when you were talking about empathy, I was thinking in my mind the battlefield, in the battlefield context. Yeah. The hearts and minds context, but there's two different there's two different aspects you're talking about here. You're talking about rewarding empathy or lack of empathy in the in the the in the yeah. uh, chain of command in the, in the hierarchy and yeah, and so but but it's all linked. And if we, you know, if we come back to the you know the I've got a little spider climbing down my microphone here. Oh, sorry. Um, no, it's all right. Um, was that, was that? I just squashed it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I've got a, I've got background in animal <laughs> conservation here. You just squashed it in front of my face. Oh, I've been talking about empathy and I just squished the spider. I did it without thinking. Sorry. Oh dear. Sorry. Uh, no, it's quite right. <laughs> Sorry. Oh my god. <laughs> Go on. Anyway, no. So I I suppose my point <laughs> is we can we can talk about empathy and um, people's ability to mimic it because it's in their best interest. Um, they can they can talk a good talk about how they care about their soldiers, how they want their soldiers to do well, um, but but they're not necessarily feeling it. They're not they're not genuinely empathetic about that person. They just recognize what they need to do in order to fulfill their role as a commander, which includes looking after your soldiers. So I think the danger is that w what we end up with is a situation where on the battlefield, we know that as part of our training, we have to do the hearts and minds thing. And for that, we can, you know, we can go into it mimicking empathy we know that we've got to give people food and water, provide them shelter, provide them, you know, everything that they need as a, you know, as a as a person in need. We've got to come across as caring, etc. If but if we're not actually empathetic, that's where the the gap is because then when those soldiers come home and they're not now required to do the empathy thing on the battlefield, there is no empathy back at home. And, and that's where we end up with this problem back at home where they actually don't, you know, they don't have this kind of empathy or compassion for people that they actually live and work with. Whether that's mm. women, other minorities, whatever that is. I and think that example's in the minority. I so think do it's I. in the minority. So do I, but I don't necessarily think that it doesn't, just because it's in the minority, it doesn't have a massive impact. 
because it's this sort of accepted there can be accepted behaviors that um because they're not picked up what am i trying to articulate here if there are I don't think we can we should ever get to a situation where we excuse poor behavior just because you know you're a para or you're a marine or you're a soldier in general we should never be in that situation but poor behavior is 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 poor behavior and I, I know that obviously there are a lot of things in the in the press and and you know I, I have my own views on those and I have my own views on on the um the the punishment that was issued as a result well I don't see it as punishment I see it as a, a reset issued as a result um this is where this is we're talking about your three prior getting pulled off the orb yeah. right because of the redhead incident yes okay yeah I don't The fact is, I come at this with a view that uh, of having worked amongst, you know, amongst paras and marines and and other, th- you know, it. Th- this is not exclusive to those two cat badges. It it isn't. Um. But I've been in situations where. I've been in situations where they will not talk to me because I am female. No. Yes. I've been in situations where, you know, they're only allowed to say two words to me throughout the whole day, and if they go over those words, they'll be punished by the commanders. No way. Yes way. Go on. Explain this to me. No, I, that, I'm not that's totally it. a liar. I, yeah, I, no, no, I, no. I'm, I just, but, but this is what I mean. This is, this is the kind of behind the scenes, what it is actually like to be a female officer in amongst those th- th- types of people. And I'm not even going to assign this to a cat badge. You know, it is in extremely intimidating. Was it within the officer cohort, though, or no, across the board? across the board. Yeah, less so in the officer cohort. It Don't get me wrong, you can get some absolutely arrogant people um, and certain, yeah, I'd say some of them, in hindsight, are definitely narcissistic within the officer cohort. But, but this is what I come back to, is the, is the culture, is this is learned this is behavior that is learned and accepted and taught and propagated and therefore accepted. And I don't think that's right. No, I agree. I, I but yeah, I mean, I'm glad I've never experienced that. Uh, I've never seen it uh, in terms of, um, but I don't, you, I don't but think you I have. But you wouldn't see but, it. But, but, but I've worked with females. Yes, in the time I was in. But I think a lot of the time, you. I think a lot of the time you wouldn't necessarily notice it if you weren't female, because you're not looking for it. Mm. And and that's not to say I'm going around trying to find people that are screwing up, or trying to pick them up. Actually, it's totally the opposite. I, you know, I. It was so intimidating that you're almost trying to avoid the situation. You don't want to be around them at all because it was... Is this when you were a pilot? Yeah. Yeah, so... You and they wouldn't, in, they wouldn't speak with you or they would um, omit not, you I'm from not, things uh, because... I'm far from saying this is all the time. No, yeah, I, know, um, I understand that. Yeah, I but, understand that, that yeah, yeah. but the general feeling of mistrust um, of... I mean, sometimes you would... Sometimes you'd take advantage of it. It was quite funny. Um... I'm baffled by this, honestly. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I ended up doing a, an exercise. Shocking. We were in Kenya and up on Escari Storm up in Archer's Post. And I was <coughs> flying for um, a, one of the tactics instructors who was a warrant officer. And we went up and we picked up a whole load of paras on the area. And they all get in ready to go and then you could see the look of utter terror when they look forward and realize that there is a female pilot now i found this funny because i can kind of sit there and think yeah you may have wings on your shoulder but i've got wings on my chest like i'm i'm quite content with my role and my job here um 
and so we would <laughs> we would sort of n deliberately fly the aircraft in such a way that would um <laughs> Terrify the crap out of them, <laughs> but in, in a perfectly safe way, but in a way that as a passenger, it was, you know, um, slightly bumpier than was necessary. And um, so that was, a, that was a kind of way to make some, a, a, an awkward situation quite humorous. But um, yeah, it was, it was not pleasant. It was not pleasant being in that environment. And I've never ever. Ex I mean, the, the, one of the one of the things I've noticed, as you would have noticed through your time, is the incredible culture differences between different units, different subunits. Yep. And I'm not. I'm not. And again, I'm not excusing any behaviour. But I like. I am amazed that you experienced that in the 21st yeah. century, and especially from. Well, I only serve a three para, right? And yeah. two para and one para are as different from three para as yeah. as flipping the navy is from the yeah. army. The, the the differences are stark. Um, and I'm like uh, truly amazed that you have that experience. Shocking, because my 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 experience on him, I'm, I'm very like I'm very, I I've been very proud of when, of knowing that when we served, when I served on operations, how inclusive, uh, and how inclusive, three power was the mm. unit was, of people who were not of three power, mm. um, and the value we put on them. Because we needed them, mm -hmm. whatever the trade was, RMP, yeah. medic, flipping whatever. I remember female pilots. So there's there's there's, there's two Chinook pilots on mm. on on Twitter that I've engaged with, and uh, that was one of the things we we hated. We hated non paras in the UK. Hated mm. them. Get the fuck away from us. You had yeah. nothing to do with us. But as soon as we crossed the line. And when our operations with different cattle fish. It's an interesting idea, actually, that, you know, because when I think about it, there was probably more of that kind of behaviour back in the UK than there was. The bad behaviour, you mean? Yeah. You know, I'm talking about you know, being, on a, being on a course down in, like, Warminster and just existing around the camp. Um they're incredibly intimidating to the point where, you know, there was something was kicking off in one of the blocks. Um, I would not go down there. Even though, you know, I knew they were all junior soldiers. There's no way in hell I would go down there. And, you know, some people would say, well, that shows a lack of moral fiber. And if it, no, I like I would have put myself in a not in in a way that you know, they would have assaulted me or anything like that, but um, the the lack of respect which had already already been shown in, you know, in daylight, in uniform, there's no way I was going to walk into their block and say, guys, you need to keep the noise down. Not a chance in hell. Um, I'd have done that with my own guys, N not a shadow of a doubt. Would they have had a little snigger on the way out? Yeah, of course they would. Of course it would, but you know only the same as we would about our bosses, and that's just normal. But there was an underlying level of respect with with our guys towards us, and um, that there, there definitely wasn't. I mean, so I suppose how do we? What is the point of all this? Is trying to change the goals like do units want to be the best fighting units yes every unit does particularly ones like paras marines gurkhas okay fine so what does that involve what makes you the best fighting unit my <laughs> argument is you cannot be the best fighting unit without empathy and that I think that would kind of sum it up. And I, I think we have to keep reinforcing that training um, that, that that is rewarded. And it's not soft. It's not soft. We're not talking about, you know, being all sort of touchy-feely and, and, 
you know, we're not talking about making soldiers less battle ready. We're talking about making them better because they have empathy, um, that they can recognize where people are, where people are struggling and make that person better, where they can recognize where they are struggling a bit and that other people can pick them up, drag them forward. That makes them better. It's not all about, um, it's not all about you and your blind ability to just, you know, throw yourself out of an aircraft. Mm. I mean, that, that aspect of it has changed in a huge way. Um, it was de- that was definitely lacking when I was serving. That's changing in a huge way. Mm. Huge way. The su- I mean, that's the mental health support, right? But yeah, and uh, it's it's definitely there in pockets. I think. I mean, I'm I'm now six years. No, I can't do my maths. Four years out, um, and this stuff was, you know, I was just starting to be able to raise the awareness with the sort of higher levels of the, the army. Um, the Army Sergeant Major, Commander, Home Command, actually CGS at the time as well, to be able to say, look, this is happening. This is not this is not just my bad luck. This is happening across, certainly across the aircraft, which is what I tried to focus it on. Um, but, and I, uh, but my point was, this will happen again and if we don't do something about it. And lots of things were put in place after that in terms of support networks and ability for people to report it and get help, um, to get help with it. But it's it's got a way to go, I think. It's definitely got a way to go. We're an hour and a quarter in. Should we talk about something more fun? Yeah, I need to wrap it up in a minute. We need to wrap it up in a minute. Um, you need to come back as well. You should come back. We'll do it again. Yeah, for sure. This is really good. So you've depressed me the last ten minutes. I'm shocked, absolutely shocked. Well, in, in all honesty, I, I this is what I think. I think that um, I think that one or two things. So your experience is there. I, like genuinely, I that 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 has been your experience within a power reg unit, like. The disappointment within me is just unbelievable. I never experienced anything like that when I saw it. Um, and equally, and so, there have been brilliant things. I, no, I know, but so, so I don't so, want to make out no, that no, like, I, yeah, everyone's yeah, yeah. terrible. No, it's, it's, and, too yeah. <laughs> it's too late now. It's too late now. It's too late now. But it. no, because they you it know, ruined my week. It's Monday. You know, there are some. There are the majority are fantastic soldiers, fantastic officers. I'm trying to recover it now, aren't you? And well, it, but you know, I've got friends who are in the Paris who are equally mortified that that some of my experiences and you know it's, again it's not just bad my bad luck it is you know you don't have to scratch the surface very hard to find more more people with similar experiences but but there are some absolutely fantastic people in there and there's a and there's a reason that they want to keep pushing to be the best my point is we just need to make sure that what we're striving for is the right thing to be striving for. Mm. And it's not at the detriment of being an incredibly good, the best fighting force. It, it doesn't have to be one or the other. We just, yeah, no. we just need yep. to, we just need yep. to lift up the empathy side in order that it comes with the fighting combat strength side. Yeah. I mean, I, I, ju- I, my thinking is that you have a really poor view of the of the army in general. Uh, uh, no, I don't, not you have a poor view. Yeah. Your view is really poor because of your experiences. I don't know. I can't help thinking that you've been in some. So you get like silos and channels, yep. ch- like like a uh, like temporal channels and silos of units and people and cultures that are just shocking. Mm. They're just shocking. You get it in business. I'm not. It's not excuse me. You get it in business. You get it wherever. And I experienced those when I was serving, where you just you know, as a section or up the tuner a company at a specific period of time, you think back and you go, "Oh my god, mm. what the f- was going on there? Yeah. What were they like? What was the behaviour like? What were they doing?" Yeah. And that could last a week. It yeah. could last that in certain circumstances. It lasts years. Yeah. If you get because although the the period of time that the commander is in charge of it or the whatever rank is in charge of that unit, if they are, if they are 
African youths who are grooming them is the wrong word. Yeah. If, if, they, if, if the they've been person instilled. taking over yeah. them is going to do exactly the same yep. thing, it's the wrong mismatch of personalities at the wrong time to enable just a really poor culture that can survive for much longer than what yeah. it should do. Case in point, like w- things you've just described there. Yeah. Like, if I saw into that, I'd be fucking shocked. I'd be yeah. shocked. One because, one because, it's like 21st century. Even when I was, I left in 2011. Even then, I'd just be shocked at it, right? Maybe 10 years before, when I just joined up, I wouldn't be so shocked by it, and I'd be think it would be okay, like not be okay, but I wouldn't even bat an eyelid to yeah. it. For example, getting your back, like a, a woman getting a backside slap and step in the office. Now I never saw that, but at the same time, the in 2001, when I just got the three power, maybe maybe I wouldn't say anything. Yeah. Fast forward 10 years later, they'd be like, "What? Well, that's being yeah. inappropriate." Um, my point, yeah, that's my point. I, I think, I, I, th- I'm ho- I hope you had poor experiences with poor people in siloed parts of the unit. That's why I'd like to think it may not be yeah. the case. And I come back to the the education. Not that I makes it okay, mind. No, no, but I come back to the education piece. Is that if we, you know, we need a reset. We need a a reset of what is what is acceptable so that those people that are the swing voters can more easily identify where they're kind of being funneled into this slightly toxic culture. I'm not even going to say toxic culture, actually. I'm, what I mean is poor behaviour which has become accepted. Um, if If they're not taught any different, of course they're going to be funneled in with that. And of course, then it's going to be a bit of a shock to the system when somebody comes along and says, no, that's that's wrong. We don't accept that. And it's like, well, I've been taught that this is acceptable for the last 10 years of my career. How was I to know? So if we if we get the education right early and can have some kind of influence on the people that they want to do well, they want to do the right thing, they want to. They want their unit to be the best. They want it to be able to um, be cohesive and and exclude people with the poor behaviour rather than exclude people that are being picked on. You know, you can only do that through education. I agree, yeah. And it starts day one, week one. You know, uh, the, the, absolutely. the people in depot are the people absolutely. that become the commanders, 100%. Yeah. And so... I, and so you know where it's where it's tricky and where it will take a long time is that you you the trainers that you're using are often have been subjected to this kind of culture imbalance for quite some time and y- you need to make sure that it's this training is not delivered with a wink and a you know kind of yeah this is what I should say but I don't really believe it because that is as bad if not worse to changing any kind of culture yeah um, uh, i mean society's changing as well which which is going to which will also have a positive impact on mm. or is having a positive impact on the on the way the military yeah. are and in, in those bad you know in those yeah. bad behavior examples from you know from a sec from sexual harassment to racial discrimination yeah. to all of those things that shouldn't exist right and society's changing which which will change the yeah. way the military are but i mean i i it, just by saying this on this podcast makes me nervous because makes it makes me lose subscribers. Well, <laughs> but, <laughs> but 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 that makes me yeah. that makes me why is like, that? Because I know that the you know I recently posted something on LinkedIn about this, and the number of people that I got well you know if you if you don't like it then you shouldn't join the army. You know, and I'm like, I, that has an effect. It sticks, and and I'm like, well. <sighs> I want to it's a so real. It, I put I put myself in a really vulnerable position by saying it, but it's what I fundamentally believe, and I and I, you know, I consider it. I can say it now because I'm out, and and my career is not affected by it. Um, but but it's a dangerous, dangerous thing for me to say if I was still in. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I agree. Um. I yeah. I agree. Well. Yeah, I agree, definitely. I mean, on the social media side, man, unfortunately, especially for military social media, unfortunately, like the the, the it's use the word toxic just now. The, the 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 military military on social media is some of the most 
toxic corners of social media get on there. I'm absolute, glad you say that because absolute it's Absolute war. Horrid. I'm, not, it's, I'm generalizing, yeah. obviously, but yeah. I mean, you go on to any Philly Boots post about anything to oh, do I, with. I, I don't even go on that. Uh, you have a look and you can just spot the people on there who are fucking idiots, right? Who are, but, but I I try and take comfort in the fact that, that I try not to get wound up by it because one, I think that most of those people who are saying those things, they're not those people in real life. They got a, they've got a social media personality which is not the same personality as in real life, which doesn't make it okay. And two, fucking opinion is worthless. What they're saying on social media makes no difference. Like, I try to, yeah, try to apart ignore from, it completely. Apart from LinkedIn, where, you know, people do have... I mean, I think one person posting back the whole comment about um, if, you, if you don't like it, then get out. And I think his subtitle was something like pilot hero. Like, I was Ooh, like That tells you everything you need to know. It does tell you everything. But, but, it's, but the fact that he was prepared to you know with everyone had to be having full knowledge of who he is where he works you know his potential future employer being on that platform and he's still prepared to say that like that i find very troubling i really do mm. um so you know i now work for myself by myself so there's no real consequence for me to say this kind of thing but that and I, it, that in itself, I find very sad that that's the only way that I'm prepared to to say it, to talk about it, um, because I've got that distance from it. And and my I suppose my point is that those people, I say again, people, but okay, let's say women that are still in, they still think like that. They just can't say it. And that's not right. No. No. And 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 you talk about women there, and it's, there'll be there'll be. Uh, There'll be people from other groups who are in a similar yeah. situation. Yeah, and, um, and don't get me wrong. Like I have fallen into the trap of going along with certain behaviours with you know people of colour or you know certain you know acceptable phrases that were used or or you know insults or terms that were used, which in hindsight were hugely insulting. I got wrapped into that. Of course, I did. Would I carry on doing it because it was accepted then? Absolutely not. Absolutely mm. not. But I mean, no, those that kind of. I'm those begging kind of that thing. we talk about something more fun to end this podcast. Like <laughs> my blood is going to explode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those things exist, though. That's always going to exist. Yeah. This is the unfortunate thing. It's always going to exist. Yeah. But there needs to be minimum oppo- minimum opportunity for it, and it needs to be. 99.9% of society need to be yeah. able to not accept it. Yeah. Like I think back, I told this, I was thinking about something recently, I told this uh, story privately, and I, and I thought I won't mention this in the podcast, but I will. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I feel I'll admit certain details. No, it was when I was serving, and I remember a situation early on um, where, and you sort of touched on something similar to this earlier, early on where um, we were, there's a group of us who were acting in a way that was, uh, at the time, was acceptable, and we were just, you know, lads being lads, and uh, and it was, we, when I think back, it was outright bullying of an individual, yeah. outright bullying, yeah. which could quite easily have led to him chopping himself. Yeah. And I think back, and then I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I think back and recognise mm. that. Mm. But at the time, when I think back, and at the time, why were we doing that? Because it was just what it was it was just normal and the behavior itself is okay but like it is okay if we had if we had realized if we would if we had been in a position to realize like the 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 person it was with it's like the right behavior wrong person does that make sense yeah they absolutely. were not like they were not complicit with what was going on and the lads being lads behavior that was going yeah. on over a over a period of time mm. Over a period of time. But even in you saying, describe the way in which you describe looking back on that, you know, you you have the ability to recognise that, you know, you kind of got swept up in a, you know, a, a culture, as it were. You, But you also have the ability to look back and recognise the impact that that would have had on, not just on that person, but on, you know, his future career, his future place in, within the unit with... You know, and and therefore, dot 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 operational effectiveness. You know, did we did we potentially lose that person, or could we have lost that person? Yeah, well, um, I mean, he's, we're not like he went on to have a 
a decent career. Yeah. But he and must, be, he be must have, that say, he must like, have oh, been miserable. Made him stronger. He, like, he must bullshit. have been miserable. Yeah. It makes me feel horrendous. He yeah. must have been miserable for a long time. And if he wasn't, then kudos to him. But there are people you know. that will look back on that and and not be able to do that. Oh, not agree. be able to see that person's point of view, how it would have made them feel. They will still find that appropriate and funny that what that person was put through and and that's the kind of person you will be very very careful about that they don't they can't recognize their own impact on other people and because they don't have empathy Mm. we can all make mistakes but it's about how we correct them and, and what we do about it that that's you know and we can make big organizational mistakes in terms of where we're going in as in direction but it's the ability to recognize it and do something about it that that's that's the key that's that defines us as how good an organization we are that we can recognize and and that's where i think the the paris thing was really positive that they made such that such a bold action was taken to address this what was a, a cultural issue you know, depending on which side of the fence you sit on that, um, and recognizing that we've we've got changes to make. I can see from your face <laughs> you fundamentally disagree with the outcome. No, of that. no, no, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't. That that whole situation, I've thought a lot about it. Yeah, is not like is not clear cut, is it? It's no, difficult. No, it's, defi- it's, it's definitely really not. difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we do have to wrap it up. Um, you, you can come on. You will come on again. You have to. We haven't even, yeah. t- we haven't even talked about art. I know. We haven't talked about <laughs> task. We haven't talked about anything apart from you making my recollection of my military service miserable. Miserable. Uh, and now I feel really guilty. Well, but, the good thing but is... But then I, I come back to that's that's you. On, uh, as in... Oh, it's my fault. No, no, no. What, <laughs> what I'm saying is just because it... I suppose it's what I was saying earlier about not being so hard on myself that my, you know, my experiences, my views might make somebody else feel more comfortable. It doesn't mean I should change them. So, but that's... The the difficult topics are the most important ones to talk yeah, about. Yeah. You know, and especially in a situation where we're talking about this and like some things we, we agree on, some things we don't. And we are definitely definitely do not have the same experience and things no. for a variety of reasons and uh and um i'm glad we did it i like a, a good conversation good conversation i was squirming in my chair a few times a good conversation but yeah. um look you don't you're not far away so yeah promise to come let's back up let's do this again let's yeah. try and do it before christmas yeah let's yeah do it. if we can get in the diary yeah. and then we will i don't know what we'll talk about then but we power reg will be painting, off limits painting pictures <laughs> And raising money for animals and not squashing spiders on the table. In all, in all, yeah, sorry. In all seriousness, right. Hannah, art. So, hannahsugold.com. Okay. Yep. And then the links to Tusk are on there as well, right? Yeah, they are. All your arts on there. All the arts. What have you got on, on right now? Quick plug on Tusk. Uh, not on Tusk. Quick plug on, well, Tusk and Hannah Sugold. Um, just past £100,000 fundraised for Tusk this year. And. Uh, yeah, not doing a show next year because they're now so big that I can't physically produce enough work to fill that size gallery. So it's going to go down to a show every other year. And in the meantime, fulfilling some really interesting commissions that are going out over the world. I love the art, by the way. I love it. Thank I love you. it. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely love it. When I get a space where I can hang one on the wall, I'll be purchasing uh, a print, maybe. Yeah. I don't think I can afford an original. Um, yeah it's doing it's doing good things and um you know i it's dragged me out of out of a hole and and can continue to to do great things for conservation so i'm really pleased with it well that's good considering the nightmare it sounds like you've had at the beginning of the year you are you are but this the nightmare was a good thing you know I, I, i firmly believe that i'm not just saying that I I really believe it's it's led to great things. It's produced some of my best work. Um, it's meant I can buy the other half of my house and and survive it. And that's all been down to the art pulling its weight. So no, I I 
I'm really glad this whole thing has happened. Like I say, the pathological optimist. Oh, and the superstition. I wanted to ask you about that. For God's sake, Anna yeah. Shergold, it's been an absolute pleasure. Until next time. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the, uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H Hour. Becoming a patron of H Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they only release to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK Podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK Podcast. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.